Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin shortly and it will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we would love to connect with you. So on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly. It will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Once again, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I will be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state and your organization. Be sure when responding to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. We will dedicate the last portion of the conversation to, re to respond to the questions you post during the discussion. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to all who registered. And we are also live streaming the session on our Facebook Live page as well. All resources that you see shared during the conversation will be sent to you in a follow-up email. And finally, we will be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during Q&A and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Finally, before we start, I would just like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars, including sessions in this 3 p.m. Eastern time time slot and frequent sessions in the earlier 12.30 Eastern time time slot as well. Next week, we will hear from a panel of superintendents as they discuss their priorities for the coming school year, including the future of remote learning and strategies for accelerating equitable learning recovery. The following, June, following week, June 22nd, will include a double header, starting off with a funder to funder conversation featuring the Overdeck Family Foundation and local funders in the GLR network that are investing in parent coaching. Later that day, we will continue the conversation from the April 27th GLR Learning Tuesday session, hosted in partnership with Education Week, as Dr. Deborah Long returns to share more about how tools of the mind can be a resource for accelerating equitable learning recovery. On the 29th, we have another peer exchange conversation, this time focused on how GLR communities are engaging with higher education partners, and while it's not on this slide, we will also share that the 3 p.m. session on the 29th will also build on the April 27th session, with this session focusing on playful learning with Kathy hirsch Pesek and others. We are adding links in the chat box where you can access more information and register for these upcoming learning opportunities. Joining you now is Sarah Torian, a senior consultant for the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Sierra, and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesday's webinar entitled Accelerating Equitable Learning Recovery Post-COVID, A Few Big Bets, Part Two. As the name would suggest, this session represents the continuation of a conversation that began last week as the campaign for grade level reading is sorting through the wide range of strategies that can support children's early school success to identify a few big bet strategies that can be advanced right now to ensure that the children most affected by COVID-19 receive those supports and resources that they need to help them recover. These sessions and this, big, and this focus on big bets are responding to the growing body of research and data showing that while the educational fallout from COVID-19 affected everyone, it reserved its hardest punches for the most vulnerable. Children in economically disadvantaged families, in fragile and otherwise marginalized families. For these children, the very necessary school closures and resulting loss of in-person instructional time, coupled with limited access to remote learning devices and connectivity and support, have caused significant disruptions in the learning process, causing them to fall far behind their peers, despite the heroic efforts of teachers, administrators, parents, and the students themselves over the past year. 
for these children, McKinsey's prognosis could be prophetic. This could be the hurt that lasts a lifetime. The Campaign for Grade Level Reading believes that this is a moment that calls for big bets, for strategies that can deliver more than incremental progress and instead contribute to transformative change and for an urgent and sustained commitment to accelerate learning in an equitable way. So last week, we hosted a session that explored two of our three big bets. The first was significantly expanding the number of national board certified teachers teaching in classrooms across the country. The second was embracing the idea that learning happens everywhere by integrating learning opportunities into the places and spaces where children and their families go regularly already. If you missed that conversation, I'm posting a link to it in the chat box, and I'd strongly encourage you to check that out. Today, we will continue the conversation, this time lifting up ed tech enabled teaching and learning as a third big bet. To ensure that education technology accelerates learning in an equitable way though, this big bet also includes digital equity as a precursor and precondition for successfully attaining powerful learning through education technology. Today's session will occur in two parts. The first will include a conversation between Jean-Claude Brizard and John Gompertz as they frame the challenge posed by the existing absence of digital equity. Afterwards, a panel of leaders committed to digital equity and education technology will discuss the challenges faced by economically disadvantaged students over the past year and solutions to the digital access gap. Followed as always by uh, time for Q&A with you and other listeners today. And to begin this conversation, I'm incredibly honored to welcome and introduce our first two presenters, and then I'll come back on in a little while to introduce the panelists after their initial opening conversation. First, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Jean-Claude Brizard. Jean-Claude is the president and CEO of Digital Promise, a global nonpartisan nonprofit organization focused on accelerating innovation in education. Previously, he was a senior advisor and deputy director in US programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, focusing on PK through 16 education across five communities in four states. And he's also served as the chief executive of Chicago Public Schools and superintendent of schools in Rochester, New York. Jean-Claude will be joined in conversation by John Gompertz. John is a longtime leader in nonprofits and government organizations devoted to civic engagement and creating greater opportunity for children and youth. Most recently, he served as the president and CEO of America's Promise Alliance and also was director for AmeriCorps in the Obama administration. I'm delighted to share that John has recently joined the campaign for grade level reading and is now serving as a senior fellow with the campaign. So welcome, Jean-Claude and John. John, I'm gonna turn it over to you to continue this conversation. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks as always to Sierra, who does such a good job of managing these, uh, these webinars and makes them all so high quality. Um, this is super fun for me because Jean-Claude Brizard is one of my favorite people. And I, he's gonna be one of your favorite people soon. Um, when I grow up, I wanna be Jean-Claude. The problem is I'm already a lot older than Jean-Claude, so I don't know how I'm gonna make that happen. Um, in a second, we're gonna watch it. We watched that video, uh, Jean-Claude, I just want to, I want to ask you, you've had a lot of big jobs. Um, you've run big school districts. You were a very senior player at the Gates Foundation. So why, and, and you're very much in demand. Um, so what was it about digital promise that spoke to you particularly at this moment? I'm, I'm really curious, you know, like why did this opportunity um, jump out at you and say, yeah, I need to do this? John, first of all, thanks for the great compliment. I'm a big admirer. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a John Campos groupie for sure. Um, you know, when when Karen Cato, my predecessor, decided to, um, to move on, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, what people may not know about me is that I got introduced to tech-enabled education as a physics teacher in Brooklyn, New York, so many years ago, yeah, using these Vernier software suite that really helped me bring a lot of kids who are not on the honors track or the regents track to take on the physics regents course in, in New York, in New York City. And I had 85, 90% pass rate. Uh, that convinced me, frankly, the power of technology and what it can do to really push the needs for kids. 
At the same time, when you look at digital promise, we live at this amazing intersection. We're a bit of a unicorn in the field. We live at the intersection of research, practitioners of practice and innovation. So we bring all of it to bear um, in the classroom. And we have a lot of to work with who are again on the ground practitioners in schools across the country. Awesome. Okay, we're going to hear more about that in a second. But Sierra, let's show the little video of Jean-Claude giving the flyover about digital promise and why it's so important right now. And then we'll come back to this conversation, Jean-Claude. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Digital Promise was created in 2008 by an act of Congress and launched in 2011. Today, we are Global 501c3, focused on improving equity and opportunity for learning through technology and research. We harness the power of networks, stories, research, and powerful learning experiences. We are in 32 states across the US and in eight to 15 places across, across the world. In 2020, we faced the largest global education crisis in the last century. Um, children may not be coming back to school, suboptimal learning environments, mental health challenges, and the potential for real loss in earnings by young people if we don't do what we need to do to fix this problem. More closely to the US, we launched a challenge about six, eight months ago, looking at issues that systems, school systems were facing on the country. We found five uh, dominant issues. One of student engagement, teaching with technology, technology access, mental health and trauma, and of course, connecting families to student learning. We think parents have had a view in the classroom they're not gonna let go of, number one. Number two, 53% of a child's time is spent at home, making sure that we connect what we do in schools with our families, holding on to what we experienced in 2020 is a fundamental part of the work that we actually need to get done. So when our big bet is to push to close the digital learning gap, and that includes three things, gaps in access, gaps in participation, and gaps in powerful use. And in, in, and in powerful use, we talk about powerful learning, the issues of personal and accessible ways of teaching and learning, authentic, challenging uh, curricula, collaborative connected ways of, of teaching and learning, and making sure that what we're pushing is inquisitive and reflective. We talk about two fundamental challenges. One, the fact that we have a disconnected teaching and learning and assessment system, one that is not focused on powerful learning, the whole child, and frankly has a myopic and narrow way of measuring success, and one that does not address the needs of the individual learner. And the second challenge is a persistent and shameful digital gap. By focusing on the individual learner, we talk about learner variability, the fact that no student is really average, that we really have to understand every student's struggles and strengths, and to make sure that we approach children through the science of learning and the science of development. So to make sure that we have and address the challenges I've mentioned, the big bet, frankly, the work that we need to do is to make sure we close the digital learning gap, gaps in access, participation, and powerful use. We cannot just drop the box of technology and walking away from schools, but the work that we need to do includes a real meaningful integration of, of technology into the classroom, into pedagogical practices, into curriculum. So, Again, the three things that we know is a part of closing the digital learning gap is access to technology and broadband, uh, real meaningful participation and powerful use. In March, 2020, we had 60 million K-12 students who didn't have access to working devices, high-speed internet or both. We're now at the gap of 12 million and we know we have a long, long way to go. And the fact is that most students who are uh, experiencing this issue, our kids will live in rural areas or live in poverty. One of the examples, exemplars of work that we've seen done with Digital Promise and Verizon uh, includes working with schools across the US, giving them access to broadband and technology and providing real meaningful coaching and support at the school level to support young people. The results speak for themselves. Teachers, students, families give it a high approval rating. And we know that 93% of all these schools pivotally, seamlessly pivoted to distance learning. So the big bet again is to make sure that we close the digital learning gap. And to do that, we have to provide the kinds of meaningful access to technology, meaningful integration of, of that, those kinds of tools into the work we do every single day. Thank you. That was great, Jean-Claude. Um, thanks. thanks. 
uh, let's let's break some of this down um, a little bit. I mean, I get that digital promise is a big digital learning is a big bet for you when you're head of digital promise. Duh. Why should closing the digital learning gap be a big bet for the campaign for grade level reading? Why is this one of the places that we should be putting our energy, our all all the kinds of resources that we have? John, let me, let me perhaps paint, paint a, a picture going back to this idea of the digital learning gap. One, when you look at the way in which we are teaching these days, and I think this is before the pandemic, when you look at interventions, when you look at assessment, whether it be formative um, or interim in the classroom, how connected these things are, are becoming. In other words, um, you assess in your math learning and that kind of data comes back to the teacher who then builds an intervention structure for, for students. When they go home, they may practice certain things. Uh, when you look at that kind of connected learning, I mean, you really need a kind of technology underpinning that gives young people and their families access to information regularly. If we're to leapfrog and look even further, there's a lot of work being done right now around the comprehensive learner record, how students keep track of their learnings, et cetera. When you look at that kind of powerful and really understanding what is the underpinning of teaching and learning and assessment and information collection requires that kind of really good, stable, phenomenal access to technology. And we know that without that, frankly, some parents, some young people are going to be left behind. The FCC, the acting FCC chairwoman talks about the homework gap. This idea of making sure that the devices and the technologies is not only available within the school day, but that young people take it home as well too, and they get used to it and they're using it and families have access to it. That's really a big part of the reasons why this has to be closed. And by the way, it is not a one-time infusion of dollars into the work. Yes, that is the beginning of the effort, but a consistent way of supporting refresh, access to broadband that is not a short-term access, but long-term access. All of this comes to play when we talk about in terms of the digital learning gap. I like what you're what you're saying here, Jean Claude. I mean, we've historically heard about the the digital divide, just an access, a pure access question, and then we've heard so much about ed tech products that help you with learning or help you with math or whatever. But you're talking about sort of the intersection. It sounds to me of both of these things, and then a, a, a digital underpinning to all learning. Am I am I getting that right? Absolutely. You know, so lots of products are being developed and parents like me who have young children, you know, the iPad, the desktop is ubiquitous across our home, right? And, and, and my children are using technology to access learning on a regular basis, um, on a regular basis, without that frankly, kids are, are left behind. So when you think about the fact that some families and some parents don't have access or to have sufficient access, frankly, to devices and, 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 and access to broadband, they are left to only having to use this in school. Um, you know, during the pandemic, unfortunately, a lot of our libraries, for example, closed, right? Um, so when you think about for many kids, that, that kind of out of school provider, or out of school time provider was a local library or local access uh, to broadband, uh, replacing that uh, was a big effort on our library systems in providing access. But still, when you look at the fact that some places you have the kind of desert of access to, you're leaving gaps behind. So the solution I'm pushing again is not just to provide devices to young people, but to make sure that the entire uh, uh, sequence is actually met, the integration of the devices or the technology in the classroom. Teachers know how to use it, what it means to their curriculum pedagogy, how young people and their families are accessing that after school and during the school day. All of that becomes the effort, but the, the foundation, frankly, it, it was, we have to solve the access to hardware and the access to broadband and making sure our educators know exactly how to integrate that into the uh, lesson planning and unit planning. So I hear you on the the sort of we got to solve the last mile problem. We need to get you know, high quality, consistent access to people's homes. And we saw in the video how much time kids spend actually physically in school and how much time they spend in the home. But I've been to your house. Sometimes it's a little chaotic in your house, but you guys are pretty good at like, OK, and there's space for people. We know that a lot of people 
about whom we're most concerned and who who've been hit hardest in this recent um, you know turn of events uh, live in places that are not actually wonderful places to focus to learn. So even if you've got the pipes and the pieces to look at, um, the space isn't right. And look, this is true for us as adults, right? We go to the office or we used to go to the office um, or we try to work at home, but sometimes we go to Starbucks or we go to some quiet place. How about third spaces for young people that really are designed to have the right kind of atmosphere for learning, particularly for those young people who, who you know, for whatever reasons, it's nobody's fault, it doesn't matter. Like their homes aren't great learning spaces. You know, John, I've seen two great examples of exactly that, where the, the people see it as a community issue and not necessarily just a school issue, right? So I'll give you an example. So when the pandemic hit, uh, the Commit Partnership in Dallas uh, looked completely, revamp their access to the community uh, sort of offerings around technology and access to broadband. What they realized was that a lot of families couldn't even access the free or the reduced services from the Comcast or the Verizons of the world because of the requirements of, of documentation. So they're solving for that by creating community centers as well as changing the school construct too to really integrate all of it into one. When I was working at the Gates Foundation, we saw it happening at the Seattle Housing Authority, the King County Housing Authority, where they begin to create a kind of out of school time access for young people. They had a place to go. In fact, one, the King County Housing Authority had these pods where they hired these high school kids or college kids to come in as tech support for families, for young people to come in and continue in their education beyond, beyond the distance learning school day, but by providing that kind of bridge access to young people. So seeing it as a community issue, and if you are in a rural part of the US, making sure you're supporting the kind of infrastructure built too, and there are folks who can help us do that, um, has to be the way in which we look at this. And by the way, that's the push to the governors. It is a push to the federal government that this is not a one-time infusion. It is really accessing and providing the kind of comprehensive support that families need, um, again, 24 seven. And speaking of my home, I have three young boys and they're active young boys, but guess what? They are kept busy and active. Uh, and we know, again, you watch for screen time, of course, but having them having access to the kinds of great ed tech products, so they, they can, their, their school continues, and very often those products are offered by through the school as well too, and we bridge um, um, the kind of access they need to, to to thrive outside the school day. It's really it's so interesting. It's I think it's a lot for people who are who are watching and listening today to think about in in their own communities and how communities can take responsibility. I want to ask you one other thing about this. This emphasis on families is so interesting. Um, and we know for a lot of families, um, parents, caregivers may not be deft with technology, may be fearful of technology or untrusting, or just feel like they're not good at it. And so we get this disjunction. And once again, we have this risk that technology actually drives inequality rather than closes uh, inequality because parents who are more educated have different kinds of work situations, just have much more comfort and fluency with technology. So even if you're able to reach young people, how do you help parents not feel left out, feel angry, resentful, uh, or just disempowered? You know, I was having a very similar conversation with a superintendent a few weeks ago around access, around this kind of community support. Where this, is, this has worked really well, John, is when uh, schools begin to believe that they are a part of the community and not the only one who has to find a solution for the community. And let, let me qualify that. You know, in many places where you have perhaps parents who work two or three jobs who may not understand how to engage the school system, really smart systems tend to really branch out into the CBOs in the communities that bring this kind of effort. And again, an example from Washington State with a group called the Somali Parent Education Board uh, who have found a way to support the high-lying school system, the rent and school system, and really bridging the effort and saying, this is what our families are looking for. And by the way, they are fighting hard to make sure that the innovations they experienced during the pandemic is not lost when kids come back to school. 
things like really integrating Somali history, Ethiopian history into the regular core. So really wonderful things have happened and we have to capture those to make sure again, that schools understand that. And, and lastly, is that I think if there's one thing we learned this past year during the pandemic is that families and parents are a fundamental part of the work. We've always give that to lip service, but now we have seen that is critically important. Many school systems never use learning management systems. Now just about all of them are using learning management system. That perhaps is an entry to the parent, the family, so that they have ownership of the learning. They can see what is happening. Uh, whatever system they're using right now is available, should be available and make, make visible to parents so they become partners, frankly, in the work that we all need to do. If schools can use the thing that they are the only solution, they would not gonna solve for anything. Uh, making sure that the entire ecosystem supports the young person is what we have to get to. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting, you know, you talk about parent, uh, schools working with parents, but we know for, for parents who are in struggling and often marginalized communities, their experience of school has not been great. Their feeling of efficacy in dealing with schools has not been great. And in fairness, schools haven't been great at dealing with those parents and showing appropriate respect. Um, and so I know we're going to hear in a little bit about this notion of digital navigators, and I could see that digital navigators done just right might be a cool fix, and digital navigators done wrong could just, again, tip the parents and feel have the parents whose who's engagement and enthusiasm we're really, we really want, um, again, feeling disempowered. And disrespected. I wonder how you think about that. Just, I mean, as a partial answer, we wrote an article myself and with my colleagues, Vic Vucic, on the in the seventy four, talking about kids who actually thrived during the pandemic. And the question: Who are these kids? What, what have been the the innovations, or perhaps the, the areas? Everything we've seen from kids who have special needs, um, and kids who have experienced bias in school, and the stress of bias is, is no longer there. And the question effectively is, what of that can we hold on to and learn to bring back um, um, to, the, to the school system? You know, so it's, it's um, the, place, the places I've seen this work best is where you have a kind of third party independent navigator who's supporting this kind of community work. And again, going back to Dallas, you have the Commit Partnership in Tacoma, you have uh, um, um, graduate Tacoma, Buffalo, CS Buffalo, there's lots of them around the country. Uh, but very often the community foundation can also play a role in being the, the aggregator in the community who can help support the school system really better understanding how to make this work happen. And, and graduate Tacoma and Tacoma, Washington, the 350 CBOs who are attached to the school system in this organization who create that kind of comprehensive approach to this kind of work. We publish a piece, a bunch of pieces at the Gates Foundation called we refuse to lose. It was a series talking about the history and context of communities and how they wrap their hands around the school system. One, one last example, John. In Buffalo, New York, the school system gave its uh, initial stimulus funding to say yes, Buffalo, because they knew they could do a better job of bringing the community together and supporting young people. So lots of great things have happened. We're gonna to begin to start mining those for the US Department of Education and make that much more visible for the nation. But again, last to reiterate, when you have that kind of really connected community, you tend to begin to solve for what we have not done really well, frankly, in the last 75 to 100 years. Wow, that's a lot to think about. Um, we always have two goals with these conversations. One is to help people who are listening understand the issue and the response. Um, so uh, you've been great on the sort of understanding. And the, the second part is always, okay, suppose I get excited about this. Suppose I think Jean-Claude is as cool as John thinks Jean-Claude is, and he's right. And so I, and, and a bunch of the people who are listening and watching today are exactly what you're talking about. Community leaders, connected community leaders, devoted. So uh, before we turn to Irene and a conversation with other friends, I, I, what should people do? I, I can yeah. feel people across America are excited right now. What should they do to start? John, I, mean, I, I look at this at three different layers, right? One, there's a local effort. And this comes back to the kind of perhaps local navigator who can support bridging the different folks who've been doing work in the past year to come together and continue what has worked. 
um, the Consortium of Florida edu of, of Education Funders of Florida mapped the entire state looking for innovation and then trying to now figure out ways of keeping those things to continue. So these kinds of, of third party sort of, I call them aggregators or navigators, often really good at bringing different uh, actors together uh, in doing that. If one doesn't exist in your community, I would argue the community foundation often is an amazing place to actually start to bring folks together and begin to talk about what can happen. I've also seen really good work done when you have a coalition of these navigators who are pushing on the state construct and pushing on the governors and the state education people and saying, look, we need this in our community. What is your role in enabling those things to actually happen? Last, I guess, the kind of places we play as digital promises, we tend to get into the ears of the federal um, actors and really understanding what needs to be done. Someone mentioned here that uh, looking at access to broadband as, as, a, uh, as a utility, that is something right now, frankly, we're in the middle of that kind of conversation to see how much of that can be brought to bear under this administration. So there are different folks working on different layers, but I would say, frankly, the local effort often I find to be the best way of pushing this kind of conversation. It's fantastic. Look, I could, as you know, I could talk to you all day long, but that's not actually what we're programmed to do right now. So I'm going to turn that back, turn this back to Sarah for a little bit and, and then uh, on to Irene. But Jean-Claude, if you can hang with us for a little while, I'd like to come back to you after the other conversation to see what it's triggered for you and what you might say to our audience about that. With that, Sarah, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, John and Jean-Claude. I think we could all just sit here and listen to you two talk all day as well. Um, but thank you so much for so clearly articulating um, the importance of advancing digital equity to ensure that all the children, um, all children are able to access and participate in digital learning opportunities. Um, I'm now honored to welcome and introduce our panel uh, who will continue that conversation sharing insights into our families' experiences with technology over the past year, as well as some solutions. As John was saying, um, one of the things we try to do in these conversations is kind of make the case for these issues as being big bets. And then once we inspire you, hopefully, in, into agreeing with that, we try to help share some information about how you can get involved and actually um, advance work around these big bets. So we're gonna get into some of those solutions in this panel conversation that we're about to start. And so to do so, I am now honored to welcome and introduce that panel. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the conversation, that's Irene Chen. Irene is the head of communications at the Khan Academy and also serves as a school board member of a public or K-8 public school in Northern California. Khan Academy works to provide a free world-class education for anyone anywhere and is currently serving 20 million students each month and partnering with 200 school districts across the country. Joining Irene on the panel is John Ferguson. John joined the Patterson Foundation as a fellow in April 2020, just as the pandemic was really uh, spreading across the country. And he currently manages the foundation's Digital Access for All initiative, working in Florida's Sun Coast region. Um, I'm also happy to welcome Vicki Katz back to GLR Learning Tuesdays. Vicki is an associate professor in the School of Communications and Information at Rutgers University. She conducts research with children growing up in low-income, working-class, and immigrant families and investigates how family technology use influences skills development and access to learning resources and how family and, and how digital inequality affects learning opportunities for children. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Victoria Saylor to the conversation. Victoria serves as the manager of family and community education at Common Sense Media, bringing more than 25 years of experience in the education sector, both as an elementary school teacher and as a university advisor. She works closely with school districts, early childhood providers and community-based organizations, fostering a whole community approach to digital well-being. So looking at all of those different spaces that John and Jean-Claude were talking about, both school, home, and those, those community spaces as well. So welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. And now I'm delighted to turn it over to Irene to moderate this conversation. Irene? Thank you, Sarah, for that warm intro of our panelists. Um, I cannot wait 
to um, unleash the expertise of this very special panel. But before I do so, I want to give a shout out to all the attendees. Um, you are going to hear um, experts in digital equity talk about, give you practical um, strategies and tools and best practices, but none of um, this would be possible. We cannot close the digital divide and get to digital equity without you. And so we have from here, Head Start in Hawaii. We have folks from the United Way in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Indian River, Florida. I mean, it is really heartwarming to see the community-based organizations and local funders from across the country on this webinar today. So welcome, welcome. Um, I first, you know, want to kind of hear from um, Vicki um, Katz, um, a professor at Rutgers, who's recently conducted kind of a nationwide survey of low-income families because there are some insights and findings here about the strengths that we can capitalize on. It is not all doom and gloom. Um, Vicki, can you kind of share with us some of your key findings? Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's always wonderful to be part of these discussions. So just to give you um, a little bit of background, and hopefully you'll join us for the release of the study. Uh, my colleagues and I surveyed over a thousand lower income families, families raising kids in the bottom half of incomes in the United States, uh, under $75,000 a year with preschool and elementary school age kids. Um, about what this experience has been like this year. And because we surveyed them in March, we asked them to look back a year and think about what they'd learned over the course of the last year through the challenges of the pandemic, but also to look forward to a new school year and, and the very real possibility, thanks to vaccines proliferating, that it would be possible to return to school full-time in person. And that's this study built on a, a survey that we did in 2015, parents in the same demographic about issues related to digital inequality. So we could compare what digital inequality looked like in 2015 to what it looked like a year into the pandemic. And so we found, I'll just give one uh, point about the challenges. We found that the good news is digital access is up, enormously up. Um, for lower income families, the number of families who have broadband, the number of families who have uh, computers in the home has gone up enormously. Um, but the number of families that are underconnected in that the, their connections are insufficient for their needs um, or inconsistent because they have trouble paying for it consistently or keeping their connections going or, or devices that are not up for what they need them for, that proportion hasn't changed. And so when we talk about achieving digital inequality, it's not mission accomplished when uh, families say, yes, I have access to broadband. It's really about what the quality and consistency of that connection is. And when that connection is high quality, high speed and consistent, we can say that we've actually resolved unequal connectivity for that family. But we also asked parents questions about what families have done this year in response to the challenges that they've experienced, because we know that families learn even when they're having the most difficult of times. And we know that families are different and that the ways in which families respond to any kind of challenge varies. And we wanted to be able to capture that too. And so we asked parents questions about what they've learned this year by having to be the stewards of their children's educations for a year. And there's good news. Families feel like they learned a lot. Parents feel like they've learned a lot. Um, they feel like they know their children better as learners. They know their strengths and weaknesses better than they did a year ago. They feel like they are more aware of what they're, what's going on with their schoolwork. Um, a good proportion, although a smaller proportion, feel like they're more comfortable communicating with their kids' teachers and feel like they can help with homework more confidently than they could a year ago. But the good news is that the parents who said yes on all four of those measures are most likely to be parents who are, in, are living on incomes below the federal poverty line, parents who are immigrants raising children in the US, the parents that usually have some of the hardest times connecting with schools. And so one of the things we can capitalize on is that families feel like they've learned things that will make it easier for schools to partner with them going forward in the ways that the pandemic has required of them, they can now choose to. And I think that's, a, that's really important. The other thing that I'll highlight is that we found in 2015 that parents and children 
are powerful learning partners for each other when it comes to technology, that it's not just about parents guiding kids. It's also about kids guiding parents. And what we found in 2021 is that those proportions were high six years ago. They're even higher. And the number of families that that exchange is even, that parents are helping kids as much as kids are helping parents, that proportion's gone up. And so this ability to exchange who's the expert and who's the learner when it comes to technology is becoming more common and it enables everybody to learn because parents know how to handle certain information online, but their children may be more facile to at finding it. Working together as teams is something that these families do really, really well. We also see that um, siblings using technology together and learning about technology together was high in 2015. It's even higher now. So we can, there are real learning assets in these families and we should be, we should be mindful of those, but also celebrating and building on them as we move back into or into the classrooms as we move towards the fall. Thank you, Vithi. That is so, I'm really kind of um, entranced by this idea that even as we support kids to take it to learn more powerfully, we're also enhancing the family unit because the kids and the parents are supporting one another. We can't, um, we can't, we can't have one without the other. Exactly. Uh, family learning piece is critical. Vicki, when are you sharing out your findings and, and how do we get a hold of your findings? Oh, thank you for that, Irene. I think that Sarah's just uh, shared a link in the chat. The study is going to be released at an event on June 24th around the lunch hour. Please join us. It's going to be a wonderful discussion. We've got a keynote from the FCC chairwoman, Jessica Rosenworcel, who's been a champion for closing digital equity gaps after school for years. Um, and really in-depth conversations about what the findings mean for policy, but also what they mean for educators and parents as we start looking beyond the summer and into the fall. Um, so I really hope that you'll join us. It's going to be a really wonderful hour and 45, I believe. So I really hope that people will join us for that. Thank you. Yeah. John, um, I want to invite you now to kind of come on and because I want to, you have this interesting metaphor about the three legs of a stool. And so kind of share out how we should be thinking about problem opportunity. And you have, I think are just kind of an expert in how communities can think about creating digital navigators. And we'd love to learn like, what are they and, and why should we have them? Sure. Well, thanks, Irene. I think first, let's do the context on the three-legged stool. And I, I can't take credit for that metaphor. It's been around far longer than I have. But in, in the year that we've been involved in Digital Access for All, in all of our different conversations and explorations throughout that time, that three-legged stool idea has emerged stronger and stronger throughout the course of the year. And really, it's about the full measure of digital access depends on those three legs. And that's connectivity, devices, and the skills and support required to use them effectively. But as Vicki said, it's not just connectivity, it's connectivity that actually allows for the family to, you know, to be able to be successful in whatever endeavors they need. The device has to be the right device for the person's needs. A cell phone is great, but smartphones are not, <laughs> are not sufficient for most people when it comes to digital learning or remote working or anything like that. And then the skills and support to use it, we often forget about that moment. <laughs> and that's one of the really important aspects of full digital access. It's great if you have a device and the best internet connection in the world, but if you don't know how to use that device, we're still where we are. And we're not gonna be making very much progress from that. And that really is where digital navigators, that concept comes in. Because those individuals are folks who can address all three legs of that stool uh, in a holistic way with whoever would need it. So one of the things about digital navigators that's really special is that they can walk you through, right, coming to low cost or, or free internet offers, finding low cost or free devices, and then connecting you with the training that you need. Because sometimes we think of basic training as, you know, Microsoft Word or Excel, but sometimes basic training is how do I set up an email account? And it's hard to take a step back that far sometimes for those of us that have been inundated with technology for a long time. But for many folks, that's where we need to start. So it's that, that holistic approach to creating digital access. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, and I want to dwell here because we're really kind of getting to the solution part of today's conversation, right? And digital navigator is a term that now that you've defined it for us, but um, 
is it a person? Is it a program? Is it an organization? And and how do I get one? How do how how do I, if there is an organ if there is a community out there, um, how do they begin to create a digital navigator? Well, the good news and the bad news there is that there is no one way to become or create a digital navigator. So there's a lot of different ways that have worked, and there's a lot of different ways that are still emerging. So, for example, at the Patterson Foundation, we're in the process of developing a, a pilot that focuses on embedding digital navigator into the already existing job description of local organizations. So that's one way that we're looking at that approach. There are some wonderful examples, Digital Charlotte um, out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They have a digital navigator program in a really community driven way, right? Um, the Salt Lake City Libraries in Utah is one of my favorite examples. It's a partnership between local community organizations and the library where you can actually call in and get an appointment for a digital navigator in case you don't have the connection. So I think that's just a really wonderful way to be inclusive when we're talking about digital divide is sometimes we don't have any access at all to be able to do the very basic thing to set an appointment to have that help. So there's a lot of different ways that that can work. Um, one company that's, that's really impressive as well is Tech Goes Home, which is out of Boston. And they have uh, several different programs. So they actually have four basic learning programs. One is around community, one is around small business, one is around early childhood education, and one is around um, education K to 12. So it's a really interesting model that specifies for community, for example, it's fundamental digital skills, right? It's those very basic, like that email account, sending documents to yourself, those kind of things. For small business, it's a little bit more than that, right? It's those, what do you need to really be able to survive in a small business sense from, uh, from the digital literacy sphere? Because digital literacy is a large spectrum, but we have to start somewhere and you have to start with where people are. So these people can be volunteers, they can be paid staff, they can be any, <laughs> any type of, of that. But what's really important is that there's someone who can address all three legs of, this, of the stool and they're trained to be able to do that. We have found that if you're gonna do it from, a, from an organizational standpoint, the best thing to do is to really make sure it's embedded into the culture of the work, right? We've all done the four hour training that we learn and we're really excited about it, and then it kind of goes away. It's really embedding that into the culture to make sure that this is something that is continually addressed throughout time. John, that, that is really great. Um kind of to hear because, and I think, again, the reason why we're all here with a campaign for grade level reading kind of um, network is you all who are tuning in are really special because you have the relationships on the ground. You have the community um, and the relationships that, that others do not. John, can you speak a little bit about NDIA and kind of some of their playbooks they have for those who are interested? Absolutely. And I believe Sarah will post it in the chat too. But NDIA is the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and they are a fantastic resource when it comes to digital navigators and really all things around digital inclusion. Uh, they're one, one of the absolute best organizations we've been able to connect with. So you can become a member for free there, and I highly recommend that you do because it's a, a ton of great resources. But they have the digital navigator model that uh, you can look through and they actually are available for consulting to help you get something off the ground. So their model, um, I'll let you dive in a little bit more deeply on your own, but it's more important for them that it's that holistic approach, right? That home connectivity, that device and the digital skills. So those three things are integral into any type of digital navigator situation that you may have but you can really set it up, set up a program to meet your community needs, right? No, no two communities are the same. So it's really important that this approach is community driven and is designed with your partners to meet the needs of your community. Thank you. I wanna invite, if you're listening in, please type in questions into um, the chat for our panelists. We are gonna be really wanting to answer your questions. So ask away. Um, and I, at this point, I wanna kind of, invite um, Victoria from Common Sense Media, because Common Sense Media is one of the 
leading organizations in our country that have really invested time in understanding um, how we get to digital equity. They've issued a series of three reports. So Victoria, why don't you tell us about both what you've learned as well as the resources you have for digital navigators? Okay, thank you. Yes, we did conduct um, those research reports. In fact, everything we do at Common Sense is rooted in research and the pandemic. Unfortunately, we had this pandemic, but it really put us into overdrive. Um, we conducted three research reports with the Boston Consulting Group, and we found the communities were doing a lot of great things. But more than that, we ended up finding out that this is more than just the digital divide. This is really a fundamental equity issue, um, which is disproportionately affecting our families of color. Um, we know that this digital divide and closing this gap is going to take a long time. This is a long-term challenge. So we need to do more to continue our efforts um, for all kids, right? We need to make sure that that is at the forefront of everything we do. We need to make sure that we are providing equity and that we are supporting efforts to advocate um, in legislation with policies to help all families, regardless of you know their zip code, regardless of where they are, their background, um, we really want to make sure that we are there for all families. And that really is our mission at Common Sense. Um, in fact, we were very instrumental in securing over $7 billion in funding for broadband access uh, through the American uh, Rescue Plan. So we're really proud of those efforts. But we do, we know this is just the beginning, right? This is something that we need to continue to do. We need to continue working. Everybody needs to continue working with their state and local leaders, their, their national leaders to help advocate for all kids. Um, you know, at Common Sense, we're not stopping what we do. Uh, we love, love to provide equitable access and resources to all kids. So I'd love to highlight some of those resources. Um, as a teacher, um, I loved being able to find resources that could help support our families. And this pandemic really brought to light the, the importance of that homeschool connection. And it really gave families that power that they already have, right, as their kids teachers. So um, we were there to help support families. And one resource that um, we created because of the pandemic, we got right to work. We created a website called Wide Open School. And on the next slide, it'll show you um, some of our partners. We partnered with over 80 other organizations and companies to curate a library of high quality content we, um, this is all free and we do have many, many resources that don't require access. We do have a combination of offline and online activities. We also have resources in Spanish. Uh, we do have a family and teacher center. And the, these are just invaluable resources that teachers and families can come to for advice, um, for help. Anything from math, reading, uh, your, your typical you know, subject, your core content subject, to social emotional learning. We even have family resources available there um, if parents and families need that. So um, again, uh, free uh, and some of those resources do not require access. Uh, tons and tons, like thousands of downloadable resources um, for lessons. So although you need it to kind of look at the resources, you can download them. And then these are advice, tips, uh, strategies, activities to help your kids. This um, was created with the intent for distance learning, but we found that teachers and, and families are using these resources for after school, for extended learning. This resource will be so important, especially this summer. You, you find that a lot of teachers, a lot of families are concerned about the learning delays that this pandemic has caused. So this is going to continue to be a really great resource. So we wanted to share that with you. Um, we also have other areas too, as well, um, for resources, uh, children who may have learning and thinking differences. And we also have resources to help with social justice um, topics. So we're really proud of that offering that we have. Um, on the next slide, we do have our text balance offering. And this is also a free texting based offering as long as you have unlimited texts. Uh, it is intended for 
families with kids three to eight years old, but it's really relevant for all ages. Um, it's focused on raising awareness on balanced media use. And, and so again, um, it's free. We, it's easy to sign up. You just uh, text the word kids for English or familia for Spanish to that number on the screen and is available in English and Spanish. And, um, you know, you'll sign up, you get two to three text messages a week. We've also included some of our wide open school content. So when it comes to providing that access, some of these resources can be shared via our text offering, our tech balance text offering. So just another way that we are combining our efforts and our programs and offerings at Common Sense. Um, we are really excited because we have a new offering um, with the Endless Key Foundation, with the Endless Foundation. It is called the Endless Key. And this um, is really exciting. It's supposed to launch in August and I do have information on it in the resources um, that I'm sharing at the end of this presentation. But we really, um, we wanted to be part of this. It's, it's a solution for offering high quality content, again, that does not require connectivity. It is a USB drive. And we have tons and tons of high quality content with some amazing partners. Uh, you can see some of those partners there. Khan Academy is one of them. And uh, you'll see some others that I've listed there as well. Uh, again, this is available in late August. And if you'd like to learn more information about that, we will be providing information um, for the Endless Foundation where you can find more information on that. Uh, and last but not least, I know I've said so much in a little bit of time, but last but not least on our next slide, I wanted to remind you of our commonsense.org website. Um, many people know us from our ratings and reviews. Uh, we, we go there for, to find the educational value, whether it is an app, a book, a movie, any type of review when it comes to any type of media. And we know that um, parents need some guidance. They're looking for that. And we continue to be a trustworthy resource for them. And um, I don't have a slide on this one, but I wanted to also remind my fellow teachers out there that we do have an award-winning K-12 digital citizenship curriculum. Again, it's free and it's uh, research-based, it's standard aligned, and it's used in over half of our schools. So as you can see, um, Common Sense is there to help support learning. It's there to support equity. So take a look at our website and um, just to keep up with all of this because everything keeps changing and we got to keep on top of it. So we're just really excited to be here today and share all of our resources with you. Thank, thank you, Victoria. Um, there is, as you can see, just kind of like a wealth of resources. Some of them are available in Spanish um, um, and um, potentially other languages, but Spanish for sure. Um, Vicki, I just, Vicki Katz, I just wanted to go back to you because um, kind of as a proxy for the voice of families, you just heard about um, the creation of digital navigators to connect unconnected families and get them connected. Is there anything else you want to kind of add? Are we addressing the barriers you heard about? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the part that has for a long time been kind of left to last in the conversation and without it, nothing else really functions, right? We can talk about um, you know, broadband connectivity, we can talk about devices, we can talk about content that really resonates with families. But unless when things, those, those connections break down and those conduits can easily be remedied and, and made useful again, it doesn't, none of, none of this can have the kinds of, you know, meaningful promise for engagement for kids and families. And so um, in other spaces, I've talked about this as like the ABCD, of, of being meaningfully connected. Assistance is the first. So digital navigators would be a form of powerful assistance in, in local communities. Broadband, content, devices. But without the A, nothing follows. And so um, even though we tend to leave it for last, uh, you know, the notion of digital navigators or uh, you know, similar concepts that have sort of stood in the, in the gap between 
families who might have access at one time, but then run into trouble and needs and need this kind of assistance is so critical. So um, it's a it's a wonderful way place to make a big bet. All right, thank you, thank you, Vicky. Um, Jean and Jean Claude, I'm about to turn it to you in just a minute, but I want to kind of just encourage. Um, the folks who are listening to kind of share with us any kind of questions you have, because you all have the relationships. And I'm curious what you are thinking, what's your reaction to kind of the, the concept of digital navigators, the resources we laid out, questions you might have about powerful learning, and, and just kind of building the relationships between, between families and schools in, in your organizations. Um, John and John Claude, I'm I'm just kind of curious what your reflections are listening to the conversation of this panel. John, do you want to go first? I'm happy to sure. jump in. Sure. Um, thank you. Thanks, John. I mean, I mean, there's so much of what um, you know, Vicky, John, and Victoria talked about sort of resonates. Um, and I put some things, some things in in the chat. Uh, one, you know this question or issue of, of digital poverty or digital uh, inequality uh, or underconnected as Vicky described it, I think is, is a fundamental issue. And I remember I think at the beginning of the pandemic, hearing about this families who had connections to the internet, but may have had three children in school at the same time. And of course they're all getting kicked off. This is about the same time, I think is, is an important one. So it's not just about access to devices in the internet was sufficient. I think access is critical, critically important. But John's push around the three, the three elements he describes in, in, um, in the Patterson Foundation website aligns very nicely with our six elements. Ours is a bit more school-centric. Uh, I put the link in the chat as well too. Talks about the six things and one of them I also put in the chat is focused on family support. Uh, while, I, while the district may not be, or should not be the only solution, but it can also, they can also be a center for providing solutions uh, and solving for, for, the, for these kinds of issues. I mean, after all, I mean, the school teacher, principal, superintendent can have a very loud voice in pushing for the kind of sort of equity issues in the community. So I put the six elements that we are about to really make much more public beginning tomorrow with Digital Promise that really aligns very, very nicely um, with John's push around the, the um, the three, the three elements. Lastly, on, on Victoria's push uh, from Common Sense, we're big fans of Common Sense Media, Digital Promise. Um, uh, the closing the digital divide is seven billion dollars is being pushed by the administration. I think is a beginning. What I really want to make sure it remains clear, and that may be the role of local governments, meaning state and local governments, is that it's not just about the initial seven billion dollar infusion, right? It is about this consistent need over anything BCG estimates at $2 billion a year nationally to keep devices refreshed and make sure we have access. Um, um, I think it's something we have to keep thinking about. So pouring money once is what we're done. I think it's something we have to disabuse ourselves of thinking about, but making sure that we have this consistent push uh, and aligned to that, frankly, they need to really find ways to integrate that kind of work into the fabric of our students' learning experiences, I think is critically uh, important. And sorry, one, one last thing. When you think about all of the interventions, and I saw a bunch listed uh, by Victoria, in Common Sense, Noggin, um, you know, all the stuff that Read 180, Math 180, all the stuff that me initially reside in school that teachers are now using to extend the learning uh, I have one uh, um, a young woman I know who's just launched this thing called Dancing Panda by sending dosages of stuff to to um, to families. She's selling the third, second, third, fourth grade. Uh, these little quick snippets of stuff parents can do with their children at home. Uh, I think are the kinds of extensions we're beginning to see that families can easily adapt to, uh, to, to extend the learning. But to get all of that, you need really good access to good technology, good access to the internet, again, which is why I push, this is a foundation to everything else we actually wanna do. Without that foundation, the gap that we see in our communities is only going to increase. John? Yeah, I wanna turn this, I have a couple of questions and I apologize, we're having a conversation about technology and my technology is not doing great at my Airbnb. Um, 
But Irene, you know, you did a great job moderating, but you, you're a little bit of an expert here yourself. You work at a place called Khan Academy, you serve on a school board, and you've got kids. So I'm, I'm curious for your observations of this conversation and what it's triggering for you. I'm, I'm laughing here because I, I do, I do have a little bit of a, um, a view from kind of like multiple, multiple hats on. Um, I think I first of all kind of want to build upon Vicky's tone, which is how can we have a sense of like hope, right? Because uh, I do not at all, like the digital divide has been a persistent problem for decades. And we all have to kind of link arms to close it permanently. And it is gonna be a lot of work ahead. But let's not lose sight that with the pandemic, um, families, as Vicky said, all of a sudden they have a lot greater insight into their kids learning. So let's capitalize that. I think parents should be continuing to kind of really push for better homeschool communication. Like the communication I got as a parent from my teachers this year was superb and better than it, but better than ever. And I think that second point, the the skill level, like of, if you think about our teach our teachers nationwide, our three million teachers, their skills just all got up leveled in terms of using technology. Right. So I think these are two strengths that we all have going in, whether your role is a policymaker or if your role is a family advocate or if you're a local funder, these are strengths that we can capitalize on. Curious, curious if you all hear other strengths that you think that our local funders and our local CBOs should be taking into account. Yeah, it's really interesting. So let me. Um... Uh, on behalf of maybe some of the people who are who are listening, let me express a concern, and I'm really curious, Jean Claude, but really any anyone who's on this, um, I hear a lot of things that feel to me like um, reducing inequity, but I'm really concerned about the extent to which digital learning can be an accelerant that actually produces equity, which I think is different than reducing inequity. And, and I think what we've learned over, through all our years in this space is getting to equal in some domains does not get us to equality of opportunity or outcomes for kids who are growing up in challenging circumstances. So yes, 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 of course, to all the things that would quote unquote level the playing field or whatever you, whatever we want to call it. But I think those of us in the, in the campaign for grade level reading community are most, um, energized, activated by the possibilities of accelerating the learning of students who are furthest behind, not just, you know, flattening the, the playing field. And so Jean-Claude, let's start with you, but I see everybody turned on their cameras. So there's some opinions, hands are going up all over the place. So um, let's talk about that. Jean-Claude, kick us off. My God, John, I can talk about this all day. So we launched this thing called the Center for Inclusive Innovation. And that's exactly gets to the spirit of what you're talking about. Look, everything we're talking about is an enabler, right? The ultimate goal is to create a level playing field, to create the kinds of equity we're looking for. And I briefly mentioned at the top of, of our conversation, my own experience as a teacher in Brooklyn, leveraging technology to really bring this physics sort of curriculum to kids who are now on track, frankly, um, in those days to the, to the region's exam. So it certainly can be an amazing way of, 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 of like the upskilling and, and leveling. My argument has been that you can have amazing technology, amazing software, amazing, et cetera, unless teachers and parents are part of the conversation and know how to use it really well to bring that to fore, it's, 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 we're not gonna get there. Because again, we're seeing more and more this idea of con a connected curriculum, right? And even when you look at even what is coming in the future, and I mentioned two things, the comprehensive learner record. It's a big discussion now about can you mirror that learner record with the health record using blockchain technology to give student agency and access 
to their own record, right? Including AI and education. All these things are being talked about in different parts of the ecosystem, right? If we don't find a way to make sure that our, again, our, our, our talent really understand how to do this, how to connect with a 360 degree view of a child, this, the whole concept, John, you know, about whole child, all this thing becomes part of the dialogue, but this is a foundational set of efforts that have to be closed for us to actually get there. Vicky, you want to riff on what uh, Jean-Claude just said? I do. And to end on the question that you that you asked, which I think is such an important one. I think when we talk about digital equity and, and what achieving that would do, digital equity is not going to resolve inequality in education by itself. There's just too many other things that contribute to it. I think the fear, given that we are, you know, not ever going back to normal, right? I mean, we, we are going to enter a phase outside of this acute, acute one of the pandemic that will feel more like what we knew before, but there is no going back. There's only moving forward. And I think the fear is that as we do that, we will likely see technology integrated into education and learning to a much higher degree than we did a year and a half ago. If we do not achieve digital equity, we risk accelerating or exacerbating the gaps that were already there, as opposed to using technology's promise as a tool to help at least try to start closing those gaps. So I think it's important to remember that um, digital tools are not magic um, and they're not going to resolve the bigger gaps we see, but the more entrenched forms of social inequality that affect children's abilities to learn, underserved communities, uh, schools that are under-resourced and so forth, those are obviously much more difficult issues to resolve and we're working on those fronts as well. The digital equity piece in the particular moment that we're in, if we don't work to urgently resolve this, we risk making gaps wider, I think. So it's not a magic elixir, but it's also going to be part of this sort of secret brew, if I can push that cauldron reference further. Um, it's gonna be part of getting people back to a place that feels like children have opportunities to really engage in learning in a way that is joyful and collaborative and what we all want for them. Ow, ow. Thank oh, thank you, yeah. thank you, Vicky. Now I'm just gonna kind of like ju jump yeah. in here and, and tie tie a couple of things because Jean Claude, you know, digital promise talks about um, how unique each individual child is, right? Um, and that we know that learning is most powerful when a teacher can kind of meet a kid, an individual kid, where he or she is at. And so I want to kind of also kind of like dispel any kind of concerns that people in the tech world see technology as displacing the primary role of teachers. I mean, Sal Khan will always say, if you had to choose between an amazing teacher who's teaching with chalk and sticks and stones over technology, we will choose the amazing teacher every single time. But that's a false choice now, right? Because technology can just be a tool in the hands of teachers. And so when I was talking to one of our teachers in our school district, Nancy Silver, teaches in middle school, she said, Irene, we, and we asked this question, we said, this has been an, a, an awful year. We've lived through a global pandemic, but what would you keep so that we're not going backwards, that we're moving forward? What would you keep? And she said, you know, Irene, I was able to break my classroom into kind of like three different groups. And I felt that by when I get to teach to smaller groups, I could really connect with the kids. And that was enabled by having these kids using technology so they were engaged, right? Kind of working on work that was appropriate for them. So I just wanted to put it out there that how uh, technology is really just a tool in the hands of, of our teachers that we so value as well as our parents, right? I'd love to add to that, um, if I may, and, and you're right on with the whole using technology for learning, but it's not about the actual tool. We have so many great apps 
ed tech tools to use with learning, but it's, it's more than that. It's, it's our rationale for using that. So as you said, you know, is it to make connections? Is it to um, elevate your students in some way? Is it to bring families together? It's more about that. We need to be intentional about the apps and the tools that we're using and really give it some thought. What's the rationale behind using it? Not just saying, oh, it's the latest and greatest tool and I'm a great teacher because I can have my kids get on this tool, you know, or app or I'm using this in my teaching. But it, it goes deeper than that. And, you know, to your point about family engagement, this has been a really great opportunity as terrible as this pandemic is or has been. Um, um, it's really given families an opportunity to have that seat at the table and schools have realized the importance, you know, as, as a former teacher, that was one of the hardest components is getting my families engaged, especially in my families, um, you know, maybe who didn't speak English or who just didn't feel secure in their teaching ability. You know, we all know teach, parents are kids first teachers, but in order to give them that seat at the table and, and I hope schools don't lose that momentum. I think they've learned the importance of it. And I just, I'm so hopeful that they're going to continue this. And I'm hopeful that parents have learned the important role that they play in educating their kids. But um, yeah, strong family engagement component, definitely necessary. And then also the rationale behind using technology. Jean-Claude, do you want to react to any of those? Uh, you have further thoughts on on that? I'm 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 pondering this. What does success look like? Yeah. Uh, and and really alert to what Vicky said. That sounds like the lack of failure. Um, you know the oh my God, let's not let this get worse. But all of us on this call, both the participants and and in conversation and everybody who's listening for getting left behind and and I just keep thinking about like what is what does success look like that has more kids reading on grade level for want of a you know a, another metric um, by the end of grade three and and how can this um, this digital promise, you know, not your organization name, but the, the notion of digital promise be a real accelerant in this and an accelerant in, in reaching equity. I'm just, I'm sort of struggling to think about how we can flip from this, uh, let's not let this get worse to how do we make this a, an engine of real change, the kind of profound change that we want to see? Janet, there's so many different entry points to, to your comment. I'm going to leave a bit on what uh, Vicky Katz, Dr. Katz was talking about in terms of the, you know, what we saw this past year really reinforced what we've known for a very long time about the inequities in our communities. Um, this is not new, right? Um, and when you look at sort of disparities in schools, again, when I was in Chicago, I mean, I could slice a city for you in terms of access, in terms of, you know, the balkanization of, of a city, I used to call it when I used to be in Chicago. Um, of course, I spent 20 years in New York City schools, I can show you the best and worst schools in the country in the same city. Um, so the fact is, we, we I think, sort of know what to do to fix a lot of this. The question is one of willingness, and I want to argue aligning resources in a way that's mutually reinforcing. That, again, I'm going to go back to, to Dallas as an example. I mean, they've taken the sense, I mean, the commit partnership, they've taken the set, they, the stance that this is really about access to an amazing first job post education, right? And the question was, how do you cascade from that all the way down to early learning to make sure that the entire pathway of a child is, is taken care of while they seem not worrying about the 24 hour, seven day life cycle of a young person and addressing all of that. And we'd be talking about how technology can be an amazing enabler. And, and Irene was talking about this, right? It is a tool that if used really, really well, could accelerate, could accelerate learning. You know, we were created, uh, I think our original name in 2008 was the National Center for Research and Advanced Information and Digital Technologies, it's a mouthful. Of course, change all that to digital promise, right? Uh, and as, as you, if you see the evolution of our organization, we have moved from focusing on technology to focusing on equity. 
uh, of course, having the kind of innovation underpinning to all to all of the to all of the above, which is why I started out talking about the entire teaching and learning cycle. Uh, how do you really push the art to a place where it can be, begin to bring equity? If you really think about this the way it ought to be thought about, it is not a six hour a day construct, right? It is a seven day a week, 24 a whole child. If the pandemic taught us one thing, right? It taught us that families matter, the, 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 the whole child matters, and the, the Racial Equity Institute even talks about how near sectors show the exact same gap as the education sector, criminal justice, childbirth, everything. So unless you bring that kind of community ecosystem um, push to the conversation, we're gonna be talking about this 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So what I'm hoping frankly is that the pandemic has thought, in, thought enough of us what needs to happen. And I will begin to come together and say, how do we solve this? And so maybe it was my, my work at Gates that sort of bastardized me thinking that it is about the local community and how they come together pushing on the policy construct and really bringing folks together to solve really what seemingly intractable problem. Um, the profiles I put in the chat around the we refuse to lose are great examples because we saw during the pandemic that these five places in four states actually had the potential to emerge stronger after the pandemic than before the pandemic because they had the infrastructure that really saw, again, the whole childhood community push to solving, to solving this. We can do it, John, um, but we have to be willing to actually do what needs to be done to do it. Yeah, you know, I, that makes me, uh, your, that was very helpful. And your comment about Gates makes me wanna um, go into what is my upper right-hand corner to the other John and, and have you say, John, a little bit what you think local funders might do to spark, to support, to fuel, to convene, to get help communities get moving you know, on this issue. Thanks, John. I think there's there's a lot to that, right? And every foundation, if you've met one foundation, you've met exactly one foundation. Everybody works in very different ways. So I think for us um, at the Patterson Foundation, what we do is work in ways that really foster wide participation and try to make sure that collaboration is the very essence of, of everything that we do. So in, I mentioned Digital Access for All has been going around for about a year. And it, at first it was a real exploration into how do we really wrap our arms around this issue and understand it in a way that we can distill it down and disseminate that information out in ways that matter and that are really accessible. And now we've moved into collaboration phase where we have uh, right around 20 local partners and community partners that come together on a monthly basis. And some of those partners are who is participating in the pilot program that we're developing, right? And I, I wish I could give you lessons learned on the pilot. Stay tuned. Uh, it starts in July. So we're hoping to have some really good uh, insight over the next couple months into that. But really, it's to get out and play in the sandbox, right? So that's the, the main thing that foundations can do is start asking questions about this issue and start seeing what what is the energy in the community and that convening role that you mentioned is so huge just bringing together folks that want to have this conversation and providing a space to have that conversation is so critical and then what emerges from there is going to vary widely on a community to community basis but you know we mentioned a lot of different hopes from the pandemic what might emerge and one of the things that i really hope is that we don't try to just do enough to make it okay for now, but we, we try to really push forward and make sure that we're not solving yesterday's problems today, but we're really looking forward and making sure that we're setting ourselves up for future success in the long term, not just exactly what we need to survive this moment. Excellent. I want to, Sarah, you want to, um, I see that the poll is up, the survey's up. So I really, really encourage people to fill it out. It's super helpful to us around what, what parts of these conversations really pop and support the work of those who are listening. So um, if you can, please, please uh, fill out that survey. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah uh, for any closing thoughts or questions and to close us out. Thanks to everybody uh, who was talking. It's just um, a marvelous conversation. Um, really, really impressed by everybody's comments and energized by um, the ideas 
gaps and the opportunities that exist. Thank, thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. Before I close this out, um, I want to share one additional question that we've gotten in the chat box, which is, um, how can we use some of these resources that each of you have been talking about to engage immigrant parents in particular? Um, I'd love to hear any thoughts, um, advice, insights that any of you have, whether through um, application and uh, implementation of the tools that you've developed, the research that you've done, et cetera, um, for in particular leveraging these tools to engage and support immigrant families. Vicki, would you like to start? This is actually the subject that I started my research with because my dissertation topic is very close to my heart. So um, I will say that for, groups of parents that we know face additional challenges because they're unfamiliar with the U.S. school system. They perhaps don't feel as entitled to engage teachers directly to ask questions, to challenge them, etc. The outreach to them is key. One of the things we found in this most recent round of work is that, like many other low-income families, but sometimes even to a higher degree, these are families who were considered essential workers. They've taken the brunt of the pandemic in every possible way. A lot of them are terrified about putting their children back in school in the fall. Um, the outreach from, uh, from educators, from community organizations to assure them that their children will be safe, uh, that they will be healthy, and that all measures are gonna be taken to protect them is gonna be especially important for these families. Um, the thing that I, has emerged from research I've now been doing with immigrant families for 20 years is that if it's essential to consider children as part of family learning teams in general, it is absolutely crucial for children of immigrants who play vital roles, especially when they are the primary English speakers in their households. Honor that, acknowledge it, use those strengths that families have have developed to navigate technology and learn together as a way to enable them to connect with school. It takes so little to disregard those, uh, those contributions children are making, but when teachers respect and honor and acknowledge that they know that children are doing that crucial work as being bridges, it goes a long way to developing a broader, a broader pathway of trust between home and school. Would anyone else like to jump in and share some thoughts on that? Can't top it, <laughs> but I will add one thing. Um, I think providing, you know, we're really worried about providing family engagement and we put on these, these um, events at our schools. We need to start providing events that are relevant to our immigrant families. So really listening to what their needs are and if possible, having the actual event in their language, you know, when possible, um, not having just a translator there or an interpreter there, but really giving them, like I said before, that seat at the table, like you're important too. And we're gonna have something for you in your language. It's not gonna be something that's translated. You know, we're not gonna sit you in the corner with a translator. It's just not right. And if we can do it, let's do it. Uh, lean on your community for assistance. Lean on your parents as interpreters. Uh, maybe they can lead the actual workshop. You know, train them, work with, and that's, think about the whole community approach. Um, it doesn't have to be, like with our, our workshops, it doesn't have to be a certified teacher giving the workshop. If you don't have somebody who speaks that language of the majority of, let's say, your immigrant families at your school, lean on maybe a parent volunteer that you could work with and train, maybe a parent volunteer who's bilingual and train them and maybe they can co-present with you, but really inviting, making your, your environment welcoming, inviting. And, um, and that's one of the reasons we did create the Tech Balance uh, texting offering that we have, the texting-based offering that we have, is that we really wanted to be able to provide these tips and resources in Spanish. We know that there are tons and tons of other languages but with one in four students speaking Spanish in the United States, we needed to focus on that language now. Hopefully other languages will come. Um, and then wide open school. Somebody asked in the Q&A if there are resources for um, Creole and Haiti languages. And we don't have those yet. We have other languages represented in our family resources. We have like 10 other languages 
were our family tip sheets, but we also have the Google Translator on Wide Open School. So families can at least, they can at least read what the activity is and explain it to their children. Would you like to jump in, John? Yeah, I just wanna add one thing. I can't top either of those either, but uh, we have been experimenting through the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Uh, we've been experimenting with live translation in Zoom and it has been very effective and very well received. So just encourage people to really look at that and see what you can do with that because it, it has been an awesome addition uh, for us. Yes, in a conversation about digital and ed technology, technology does really provide a lot of um, opportunity for closing language gaps, for sure. Um, I mean, there's still a lot to be done to make sure that it's done in a respectful and um, an effective way, but technology certainly does open some doors to help us do that. Um, we have come to the end of our 90 minutes together. Um, I'm sure we could keep going for another 90 minutes and never get bored with this conversation, but I'd love to just say a huge thank you to our entire panel today for really outlining the urgent need to uh, provide full and equitable access to digital learning opportunities and sharing your insights about exactly how we could go about doing that. There have been so many great examples and research shared today. So I'd like to say thank you to Jean-Claude Rizard, to John Gompert, to Irene Chen, to Vicki Katz, John Ferguson, and Victoria Saylor. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and also a thank you to all of the folks who joined in for this conversation to listen in to their insights and the work that you're doing to promote digital equity in your communities. Uh, bringing up the slide with um, some additional uh, learning opportunities coming up in the coming weeks. Um, encourage you to tune in next week. We'll be hearing from a panel of superintendents as they discuss priorities for the coming school year, including the future of remote learning and strategies for accelerating equitable learning recovery. The following week, we'll have another double header on June 22nd, which will include a funder to funder conversation with the Overdeck Family Foundation and other local foundations that are supporting parent coaching in their communities. Later in the afternoon that day, we'll have um, a We'll continue the conversation that began on April 27th in an Ed Week, uh, uh, in an Ed Week uh, in partnership uh, session in partnership with Ed Week. Well, we'll, we'll be hearing from Dr. Deborah Leung about um, tools of the mind and how that can be a resource for accelerating equitable learning recovery. Um, and then on the 29th, we'll have another doubleheader, a peer exchange, with uh, a session in the morning focused on how higher education partners can support um, the work in GLR communities followed, and it's not on this slide, but by a 3 p.m. session, again, continuing the April 27th conversation, this time hearing about playful learning with Kathy hirsch Pasek. So I hope you'll uh, register and make plans to jo join in for those future conversations. And until then, I hope you'll um, uh, take care, be well, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you again to our panel, really appreciate it.